I hope you brought a Bible. Uh, I would like uh, for you to turn with me today to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, last week, I started a new series of messages on the weapons of our warfare. Because, you know, we are at war. Amen. Not everybody is aware of it, but I think if you've been a Christian for longer than 30 minutes... You probably have realized, man, this is war. It's, Christianity is not for the weak of heart. It's not for the faint. It's not for the coward. It's not for those who have no backbone. You know, if you just have to be accepted by everybody, then you're going to have a rough time as a Christian because Christ himself was rejected and uh, he was at war and you're at war. In fact, we're at war on all sides. When you think about it, we're surrounded and at war on all fronts. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We battle, the Bible says, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and wicked spirits in high places. So we war against unseen forces, but not, they may be unseen and they, they may be invisible, but they are very real. Amen. And uh, we war against those forces uh, at all times. We war against our own flesh yes. and uh, its allure, you know, towards this wicked world. We war against the flesh. We war against the world, the world being talking about the world that's under Satan's control uh, and all of its temptations and vice and immorality and so forth. We battle against the world's uh, philosophy, its values. It's all, you know what the world does? It wants to conform everybody to its image. It wants you to fit into its mold. The one thing the world can't stand... We're talking about the world now, the world under Satan's dominion. It can't stand anyone being outside of its mold, being different. It does not like anybody marching to a different drummer. So it will do everything in its power to intimidate, harass, insult, mock, tempt, anything to get you to act like everybody else acts Amen. and to do like everybody else does. And you know... The philosophy of the world is, hey, everybody does it. That's right. Everybody does it. Nothing wrong with it. Everybody does it. Amen. Oh, no, that's just you and that old-timey Bible-thumping religion. Uh, here's what the Lord says. Don't be conformed to this world, Amen. but be transformed right. instead by the renewing of your mind, right? Amen. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are human beings. We have flesh and blood bodies. We walk in that flesh and blood body. But we do not war after the flesh. We war, but we don't war against people. Your battle, your warfare is not against other people. Other people get full of the devil they do the devil's bidding. The devil uses vessels just like God uses vessels. Right. You're God's soldier. They're the devil's soldiers. But remember, your battle is against the devil. Therefore, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That is, they're not fleshly. They're not human weapons, guns, knives, sticks, stones, uh, bombs, and so forth. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal weapons, well, the fact of the matter is against a spiritual enemy are not just impotent, they're useless. You can't shoot the devil. Amen. Right. You can't stab him. You can't insult him. Can't hit him with a rock. Therefore, our weapons are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not the human weapons that everybody else in the world is armed with. But our weapons are mighty. Mighty weapons through God 
to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Don't let your mind run wild. You bring it all to the feet of Jesus. The world's trying to get you to conform to its image. The Lord wants you to be transformed so that you follow him and his example. The temptations of the world can be powerful. In fact, they can be they can be so strong, the temptations, if, if you've ever been addicted to anything at all that gets a hold of you, the draw, the strength is so powerful that it becomes beyond your personal ability to overcome it. But here's what the Bible says. 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let me tell you, Christ in you is stronger than the temptations and allures and habits and addictions of the world. Christ in you can overcome any, any such thing if you will yield to the one who is greater. Greater is he that is in you. Stronger, more powerful to break every chain like we sing about, to break every chain, to break every chain, whatever bondage, whatever addiction, affliction, oppression, greater is he that's in you. Look, we have weapons. We're not defenseless here. The Christian is not defenseless. We have weapons. We have mighty weapons to combat this horrible enemy that's out to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's what he wants to do. In fact... The Bible tells us if we will trust the Lord completely, trust Him completely, not partially, but trust Him completely and obey Him explicitly, then the Bible promises us nothing less than victory. Nothing less than victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Thanks be unto God. God. God is the one who always, not occasionally or sometimes, once in a while, most of the time, but always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. We may fight a threefold enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil, but then we have a triune God. Amen. And in Christ, we overcome. In Christ, we can overcome. We have mighty weapons Amen. that can tear down every stronghold, that can extinguish every fiery dart that the devil aims at our minds and thoughts. And you know, this is where the battle is. It's right here in your mind. Where the temptations come, the allure come, the reasoning comes, the rationalization comes, the false philosophies want to jump on you, all the doubt, the fear, the unbelief, the worry, the anxiety, all the things that want to bombard us and take us away, we have weapons. We can cast down these imaginations and every other thing that exalts itself. It wants to rise up. It wants to show itself more powerful than God. It's a Goliath that's trying to rise up. with all You know, Goliath, with all of its boasting and swagger and denunciation of the faith. But we cast down imaginations. And every other high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Amen. Here's Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Their righteousness is of me. No weapon, he says, Isaiah fifty four seventeen. No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. None. No weapon. That when, it's, when it says they won't prosper, it means they won't be effective, they won't succeed. 
they won't prevail. No weapon formed against you will prosper because we stand not in our own strength, not in our own might, not in our own power, but be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We're only strong in the Lord, not in ourselves. You're not strong because you exercise every day. I think that's a good idea, exercise every day. But as Timothy says, it's more important that we exercise ourselves unto godliness. Uh, So if you have a strong body but a weak faith, you can have a strong body but go to hell. So in our righteousness, I like what Isaiah says here. Isaiah 54, verse 17, when he talks about the servants of God, he said, their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. What a a prophetic declaration. Our righteousness is not of ourselves. We don't stand in our righteousness. We can't defeat the devil in our righteousness. Not even the best 15 minutes of our life is enough to overcome the devil and his power. But we stand in his righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord, as Romans declares. Can I read a passage to you? I want to read something from Romans chapter 3. Listen to this. You, You can turn there if you like, or you can just listen. But I want to read beginning in Romans 3, verse 21, where Paul says, But now... The righteousness of God without the law, that is apart from the law, the Old Testament law of Moses, is manifest. It's made clear, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. The righteousness of God is imputed to us by faith in Christ. Upon all that believe, for there is no difference, that is, no difference between Jew nor Greek. There's no difference. Everybody has to be righteous the same way, and that's through Jesus Christ. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then verse 24 and 25, listen to these verses. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that is, he satisfied the demands of the law, he satisfied uh, God's righteous anger against mankind's sin, he was the propitiation, the sacrifice, the atonement for us. He bore the punishment of our sin. And this is how, Romans 3.25, Through faith in his blood. Through faith in his blood. What a powerful, what a powerful statement. Through faith in his blood. That just has jumped out at me all week long. Through faith in his blood. We sang about the blood today. That was not by accident. I actually asked Brother Jason if he'd, sing a couple of songs about the blood because I wanted to share today on the blood, the blood of Christ, as a weapon. In fact, this weapon has to be used and wielded by us uh, as believers against our adversary, the devil, and even over our own minds and thoughts and the things that come against us. But he says, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, (coughs) excuse me, and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. Are you a believer Redeemed, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Through faith in His blood, through faith in His blood. That is through faith in His sacrifice for you on the cross. Because, you know, Hebrews 9.22, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Remission, the word means forgiveness. 
Uh, there's no pardon without shedding of blood, as the Bible says. You know what's interesting? The word remission, Hebrews 9, verse 22, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. That word's also translated liberty. It's also translated deliverance. Same word, deliverance. Deliverance from bondage, deliverance from captivity, deliverance from the chains that bind and hinder and oppress, deliverance of mind and body and soul and spirit, liberty, same word, without shedding of blood is no forgiveness, no remission, no pardon, no liberty, no deliverance. Let me tell you, there's power in the blood. Without shedding of blood, no deliverance. It could be translated that way, you know. In Luke 4.18, that same word that's translated remission in, in Hebrews 9.22, listen how it appears in Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, the Lord said. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance. Same word. To preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Same word. Without shedding of blood, no deliverance, no liberty, no remission, no forgiveness, no pardon. Amen. You know what it means. There's power in the blood. Amen. Wonder working power. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Would you over evil the victory win? Wait, you mean you can win over evil? You can win the victory over evil. How, how can you do that? Amen. Well, there's power. There's wonderful, in fact, wonder-working power yes. in the blood. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I like that. Yeah. I, I wonder what sometimes what our denominational brethren think when they sing power in the blood or songs like it uh, power in the blood would you do service for jesus your king well there's power in the blood in other words if you're going to serve the lord minister for the lord there's power in the blood power for service Amen. power that enables us to to carry on, to endure, yeah, there's power in the blood. Wonder-working power. Power for victorious living every day. You know, this is what I wanted to emphasize today. We have weapons. We have weapons, weapons of spiritual warfare. Uh, these weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Uh, the Bible says we'll cast down Im imaginations and Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One of those weapons, in fact, apart from this weapon, there are no other weapons. It's the blood of Jesus. Amen. It bought our redemption according to the Scriptures. Right. Ephesians 1, verse 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace. Amen. It brought us justification. That is, that's how God sees us. He puts us in right standing with Him. Justification, I like the way one fella I heard describe it this way. Justification, just as if I'd never sinned. That's how He sees us. Justifies us through his blood. Romans 5, verse 8 and 9. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Redeemed through the blood, justified through the blood, put in right standing with God the Father. You know, we were lost. We were lost, we were vile, we were headed for hell's fiery depths, every single one of us. Amen. We were lost, didn't know our way, and we were far from God. Right. Here's what the Bible says, Ephesians 2.13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were in times past were far off, 
are made near by the blood of Christ. Made near by the blood of Christ. Oh, beloved, there's power in the blood. Power in the blood. And through the blood of Christ, we've been given access, access to God. In fact, here's how the book of Hebrews describes it. We actually have access into the very holy of holies, into the very presence of God. You know, in the Old Testament, nobody went into the holy of holies, only the high priest and only once a year. And he went in sprinkling blood so that he wouldn't be smitten. Because the holy of holies, or what's sometimes called the holy place, is where the Ark of the Covenant was. The Ark of the Covenant uh, was the very seat upon which God sat. This was the seat of his presence, covered with the cherubim and their wings extended over the mercy seat. Nobody went in that sacred place. Only the high priest, and when he went in, he better go in with fear and trembling. He better have all the right clothes on, as intricately described in the Old Testament. He's got to be washed, and he's got to go through all the ritual washings and cleansings and sanctification before he even dares go in there. And he can only go in once a year. It's got to be the right day, the right time. Only with much blood spilled to begin with. Then he goes in, because that holy place is the manifest presence of God Almighty, where he said he dwelt. Here's what Hebrews says. Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Here's the point. That the blood of Jesus has provided for you and me access into that holy place where we can come by faith, where we can come by prayer into the very presence of God himself. You need no mediator. You don't ask Mary to go for you. You don't ask a saint to go for you, dead Uncle George or, or anybody else to put in a good word for you. But you yourself, as a believer, through faith in his blood, Amen. have been given boldness. The word means liberty, access. It means you can go with confidence. We don't go cocky, but we go confidently, knowing the way has been made for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We can go with fearless confidence. The high priest couldn't even go with fearless confidence. But we can, through the blood of Jesus Christ. We can go to God Almighty. And that's why the Lord told us, when you pray, here's how you pray. Father, Father, you can call upon your Father in heaven. That intimately, that personally, Father, and when you ask, the Lord said, you always ask in his name because it's his blood that made the way. His sacrifice that covers our sins. The forgiveness that he provided for us, it all came through his cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection. You hanging with me? I'd like for you to turn, if you would, to the book of Exodus chapter 12. I want us to read a familiar passage this morning. You never get tired of reading these things, I hope. But I think it's good to remind ourselves of the wonder-working power that is inherent in the blood of Christ. In fact, In uh, Acts chapter 20, I believe it's verse 28, tells us that that blood, that was the blood of God. Exodus 12 is the account of the Passover, the first Passover, when the death angel came through Egypt, the land of Egypt, on one very solemn and 
horrible night swept through the whole land and killed the firstborn of man and beast. And every house, in every house, whether it was a palace, whether it was a gated community, the gate couldn't keep out the angel of death. Whether it was a hovel or a hut, whether it was a cave, a barn, a hilltop, a valley, an open field, there was no place to hide. No place to hide from the angel of death that would come through that land. Well, there was one place of safety under the blood of the Lamb. God gave very careful instructions in Exodus chapter 12. I just would like to read a few verses here. Exodus 12, verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month will be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household is too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or the goats. And he goes on and says that you'll kill it in the evening, verse 7, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Take the blood of that lamb that you sacrifice and here's what you do with it. You strike it over the lintel, and you strike it over both side posts of the door. Now, why would you do a thing like that? Here's his instructions a little further. Just jump down with me to verse 22. He says, And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that's in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel upon the, and on upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. The, the hyssop, you just take the branch, break you off a branch, you use it as a paintbrush, you know, the leaves of the hyssop, you dip it in the bowl, over the lintel, over the side post, and go inside and do not come out from under the blood. Back in verse 11, he tells them what to do with the lamb. They eat the lamb and eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff on your, in your hand. Eat it in, a, in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. He says, verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, the Elohim, all of Egypt's gods, and they had plenty. They were polytheistic, they had all kinds of gods, and here's, here's what the Lord said, I'm going to smite them, I'm going to smite the firstborn, man and beast, and I'm going to smite their gods. In other words, their gods would not be able to protect them. They could pray, you pray all night to your stick and stone, it can't protect you. There will be no place of safety. This is what God's saying. I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be to you for a token, a signal, a sign, a flag, a beacon. It's a mark. You put that blood over your house. It better be there. And put it upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood... I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This is, this is very important. I want us to think about this. It's not enough that you own a lamb. It's not enough that you 
kill the lamb. Unless you took the blood of that lamb and applied it, you apply it to your house. You apply it to your doorpost, to your lintel. That's the only way to be safe. And then you stay under that blood. You stay inside. You know, the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God who died for our sins, the fact, the fact doesn't save you. The fact doesn't save you. It's not until you apply. You apply His sacrifice to your life that you get saved. It's when you say, oh, Lord Jesus, you died on the cross for me. You died for me. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, apply this blood to the doorpost of my life, my heart, my mind, my thoughts. Let me be under the blood, washed, cleansed, forgiven. It has to be applied, beloved. You see, if they killed the lamb but didn't apply the blood to their doorpost, guess what's going inside? That death angel would have went right inside. They would have been defenseless. You apply the blood, you're safe. You got to get under the blood. Like the old song says, Oh, the blood of the Passover lamb is applied to the door of my life. No power of darkness could ever withstand the force of the blood sacrifice. Though Satan will bring accusations, I let him know right where I stand. For now there is no condemnation. I'm under the blood of the Lamb. I'm under the blood of the Lamb that covers the guilt of my past. By the mercy of God, holy and righteous, I stand. I'm under the blood of the Lamb. I'm safe and secure from the enemy's plan. No weapon formed against me shall stand. I'm under the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Have you applied the blood yes. to the doorposts of your life, yes. your mind, your heart, yes. your home, your family? Yes. Get under the blood. You're not saved because you say, well, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. Sure. The Bible tells us that the devil believes yes. and trembles. Yes. He believes so much that when he thinks about it, He shakes because he knows his judgment's coming. He believes more than most people do. Way more. It's not enough to just say, well, I believe that Jesus lived. I believe Jesus died on a cross. Are you personally, individually under the blood of the Lamb? Lord Jesus, have you prayed, Lord Jesus, cover me with your blood. Wash me in the blood. And here's what happened. You know, Romans 3.25, it's through faith in his blood. We must have faith. But look at what happened. We're in Exodus 12. I want to read down to verse 29. Exodus 12.29. Here's what the Bible says. And the children of Israel went away. They got their instructions. And they did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. And it came to pass... That at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne until the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon. And all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up that night, he and his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. There was no place to hide. Not even Egypt's gods could protect them. No place to hide. Well, there was one place of safety for the believer that was under the blood. Only under the blood. You know, I could make, uh, I think, a spiritual analogy today and say that the whole world that we live in is the modern equivalent of Egypt. It's idolatrous, it's immoral, it's ungodly, it's anti-Christian, anti-faith, it's vile, it's cruel. Uh, The whole world is Egypt. 
And you know, the death angel still sweeps through the streets, but not just at night. The death angel sweeps the streets night and day, tirelessly, 24-7. It comes for young, it comes for old. The, the last statistics I read was from 2015, I think, and it said 7,000, over 7,100 people a day in the United States die. Over 7,000 a day, 2.6 million a year. The death angel comes still, you know. Yeah. And he never takes a day off. No. There's never a day on the calendar when nobody dies. That's right. uh, but can I tell you that the angel of death that came in judgment to smite the wicked Today doesn't come for the firstborn, but he comes for the onceborn. He doesn't come for the firstborn, he comes for the onceborn. Because you see, only those who are safe, the only ones who are safe are the twiceborn. Like Jesus said in John chapter 3, you have to be born a second time. You have to be born again. New birth. Only under the blood. Can you be born again? Amen. Amen? Amen. Because those who believe on him will have everlasting life, he said. They should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is, they won't perish eternally. The angel of judgment, the angel of death, will pass over to this day those who are under the blood. Because he's not coming for the firstborn. He's coming for the once born. If you've been born again... Boy, we sang that song. It's one of my favorite songs. We sang it this morning. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Praise God. Where? Where is cleansing? Where is forgiveness? Where are God's graces and mercies found? Where is liberty? Where is deliverance? It's, it's under the blood. It's under the blood of the Lamb. We see it throughout Scripture. We see it starting all the way back in Genesis when the Lord himself sacrificed for Adam and Eve. That's how they got the skins. When Cain's sacrifice was rejected and Abel's was accepted because it was a blood sacrifice, there's power in the blood. Amen. You know the old uh, song we sing sometimes, Are You Washed in the Blood? Yep. It's a good question. Are you washed in the blood? Look, you're still here with me in Exodus 12? Verse 12 and 13, I will pass through the land of Egypt. I'll smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, man and beast, and against the gods of Egypt. I'll execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You know what else is interesting in this whole passage about the Passover? It was to be a perpetual ordinance for Israel forever. Verse, well, verse 23, when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two side posts, he'll pass over that door. He won't allow the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. You shall observe this thing for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. Amen. Forever. Now, for the believer, for the Christian, the Bible tells us Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Now, he can't be sacrificed again. He was sacrificed once and for all. And 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 says, our, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. And there 
is our safety, our forgiveness, our protection, our deliverance, our liberty. Listen, I believe that there's power in the blood. I believe that when we are in warfare and we're battling the devil and his bombarding thoughts against our mind, I tell you what I do. I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. Just like they painted it over their lentils and doorposts, well, I apply it by faith. We have to have faith in the blood. And I say, Lord Jesus, I plead your blood over the lintel and doorpost of my mind, where these thoughts are trying to get in, to bombard me with fear and doubt and anxiety and worry and unbelief and all the other junk that he comes after. I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. I believe it's powerful. Now look, I've been doing it for 30 years plus and uh, have found that the blood is a mighty mighty weapon of warfare get under the blood you know people sometimes look at me funny that I, I, I pray for people they'll say you know I've been having these horrible nightmares at night I'm attacked night after night with these horrible horrible nightmares and I'll tell them you plead the blood of Jesus over your mind before you go to bed you you plead you do it you have to apply it you have to have faith in the blood but you plead the blood of Jesus over your mind Against all of these attacks, you know, nightmare, you know what it actually means, night demon. That's what the word means. It's an attack against us, against our peace, against, you know, tormenting spirits that plead the blood of Jesus over your mind. I plead the blood of Jesus quite a bit. Here's my own personal experience. Take it. You could take it for what it is, my own personal belief, my own personal experience. That when I'm praying for people who have blood conditions, doesn't matter what it is. I plead the blood over the blood. I'll plead the blood over their blood, over my blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. Look, I plead the blood. Through the years, I've heard quite a bit of criticism for pleading the blood of Jesus. Some of my denominational brethren have said, uh, you can't do that. I do it all the time. Too late. That's right. I plead the blood against tormenting thoughts, against temptations. I, I apply it by faith to my own life. I pray it over others when I pray for them. No, no, no. They say, you cannot do that. It's not biblical. I find plenty of places in the Bible for, uh, to justify my belief. Listen to what one of my denominational brethren said. He said, pleading the blood of Jesus has no clear basis in Scripture. No one in the Bible ever pleads the blood of Christ. Those who plead the blood often do so as if there was something magical in those words. Not magical, powerful. We have to have faith in his blood. We're redeemed by the blood, justified by the blood, put in right standing by the blood. We have access through the blood. There's power in the blood. He said, bless his heart, he said, you know, it's those Pentecostals who are doing that, you know, pleading the blood. (laughs) I said, I guess that's true, because I sure didn't do it when I was a Baptist. (laughs) Yeah, it's those Pentecostals doing that. And then here's the thing that really, really got me, because after he said, no, 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 you can't do that, he went right on. And made our case for us. Listen to what he said. Those who teach the value of pleading the blood of Jesus usually point to the Passover as support of their practice. (laughs) Guilty, guilty. Just as the blood of the Paschal Lamb protected the Israelites from the angel of death and led to their deliverance from slavery... So the blood of Jesus can protect and deliver Christians today if they apply it or plead it. Amen. 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 Hey, I'm 100% in agreement. He goes on. He says, those who plead the blood of Jesus often do so in the context of seeking victory over demons. 
Guilty as charged. Pleading the blood of Jesus is a way of taking up the authority of Christ over the spirit world and announcing to the forces of darkness that they are powerless. Some base this aspect of pleading the blood on Revelation 12.11, which says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Imagine some people doing that! Oh, beloved, we plead the blood. I sing about the blood. I pray and apply the blood. And if you don't believe it, don't sing power in the blood. In fact, I think we ought to go to their hymn books and tear that page right out of them. (laughs) Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you over evil the victory win? Wait, there's victory to be won over evil. Yes, how do you do that? Wonder working power in the blood. Wonder work that sounds mighty Pentecostal to me. A little suspicious. I think we better go inspect their hymn books. Tear some of those pages out of there. Power in the blood. Power in the blood. Quit singing. The blood will never lose its power. You have to quit singing that, too, because apparently it lost some of its deliverance and liberating power. No, the blood will never lose its power. He said, because it it gives me strength from day to day. Because it soothes my doubts and calms my fears and dries all my tears. Well, that sounds mighty Pentecostal to me. Sounds like. Sounds like maybe there's power in the blood. I'll tell you something else. If you don't believe it, quit singing nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? Wait, make me whole? That has to do with recovery, restoration, healing, health, deliverance, liberty. What can make me whole? Nothing but the blood. You know, that old hymn uh, was written back in the 19th century. It had six stanzas, but nowadays if you look at a modern hymnal, they'll only have four. Because they think it just got too long, you know. Six stanzas, that's a lot of stanzas to sing. So, especially in a church where you're going to sing the first and last, and that's, you know, one or two songs and that's it. But these guys here, they get carried away, you know. They want to sing and sing and sing. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you just can't sing enough when you're singing of and to the Lord. But I want you to listen to the fifth stanza, which doesn't appear anymore in, in most modern hymnals. You've got to go to some of the old ones to find the, the last couple of stanzas. But nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll overcome. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll overcome. Because you know they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The word of their testimonies. Now by this I'll reach my home. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Beloved, don't be reluctant to plead the blood. Don't be silenced by the voices of the critics and the naysayers and those who are spiritually powerless. Plead the blood. Sing about the blood. Get your mind, your heart, your thoughts under the blood. Just as in Exodus 12, they painted the blood over their doorposts and lentils, and then they got under that blood and they stayed there. Stay under the blood. The Bible says, 1 John 1, 7, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sins. In the continuous sense, so it continually cleanses us from sin. We walk in the light, we walk with the Lord, the blood continually cleanses us from sin. Because you know what? We still sin. We still fall, we still falter, we still fear, we still stumble with our mouth or our thoughts or whatever else. 
But if we'll keep walking in the light, you fall down, get up, walk in the light. Repent of your sins. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sins. One last verse. I quoted it a minute ago. This one's in Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. Overcame who? The devil! The accuser of the brethren. The one who is tireless in his accusations, in his assaults, in his bombardments against our mind, our thoughts, our hearts. The one who constantly tempts us to yield to him, to his ways, his means, his sinful activities. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies. And they loved not their lives unto the death. When you're being tempted, when you're being tried, when you're being assaulted on every side, when you're fighting the world and the flesh and the devil, when the battle is long and you're tired and you're weary, listen, plead the blood of Jesus over your mind. When the devil is tempting you to act in a way that is ungodly, plead the blood of Jesus over your mind. Don't think those thoughts. When you know you're thinking things you shouldn't be allowing yourself to think, When you know you're thinking angry thoughts, bitter thoughts, everybody goes through problems and trials and circumstances. I had somebody who really upset me not long ago. And I have to plead the blood over my own mind that I don't keep replaying that conversation and allowing myself to get angry about it. I battle the same things everybody else battles. We have to keep our minds under the blood. I'm not, I can't let my mind go there and just seethe with bitter, angry thoughts, you got to let this stuff go. But when it's a battle, you know what I'm talking about? A battle. You plead the blood of Jesus over your mind and you refuse those thoughts. You cast down these imaginations and every other high thing that wants to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. You see, my knowledge of God tells me I need to forgive. My knowledge of God tells me I've got to move on. My knowledge of God says, Rusty... Put on your big boy pants and overcome. Be an overcomer. And let that stuff go. All these high thoughts that want to come and exalt themselves, they want to rise up like Goliath and, and capture my mind and my thoughts and my heart and turn me angry. And turn, that, That's not going to produce the righteousness of God in me. So I plead the blood of Jesus, and I plead the blood of Jesus, and I pray, and I plead the blood, and I confess the Scriptures, and I fight the good fight of faith. That's what we all have to do, beloved. Don't just start listening to that stuff that comes into your mind. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you know, my husband is so aggravating, if I had a better one. And you know that fellow over there across the church? He's a pretty nice looking fellow. That guy I work with, he's, he's nice to me. You better fight that battle. Start pleading the blood over your mind and against those thoughts and doubts and temptations. Or if it's fear, if it's anxieties, whatever it is. Look, the, the, the devil battles us all. You may be going through some kind of battle, physical battle, a trial, family troubles, financial troubles. Here's where the battleground is, right here. And those thoughts that what are you going to do? This is the end of the road. It, look, they're exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. Because your knowledge of God tells you that you're in good hands. Amen. Not with all state, but with the Almighty. You're in good hands. He's got you. He loves you. You're His child. He can provide for all the birds of the air. He can provide for His child, right? He can provide for you. The Bible tells you that He will provide for you. That He's our supplier. And that, look, even an overflowing cup. So look, you cast those imaginations down. You refuse them. You plead the blood of Jesus over your mind. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus 
Walk in faith. Walk in victory. Walk in peace. Walk with Jesus. And if you fall down, you get up and you keep walking with Jesus. Walk in the light as he's in the light. Have that fellowship one with another. We need it. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from sin. Father, we pray that you would encourage our hearts, one and all, today through your word. Lord, I ask that, that you would help us, Lord, as we are engaged in a great warfare. We are engaged in a great battle, a great conflict. And Lord, some of us are weak, some of us are weary. Lord Jesus, we need your strength. Remind us that we stand in your strength and in your might and in your power. And, Lord, when we are weak, that's when we are strong, for we depend upon you, Lord, completely. Lord Jesus, we confess you our strength. We confess you, our mighty God, our deliverer, our liberator. Lord Jesus, help us to employ the great weapons of the Spirit that you've given us and to use them for your glory and for our good. This we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, amen. 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 Praise God.